In this video, we're going to be taking a look back at some of the most shocking moments from MTV's hit show Catfish. If there's one thing the show has taught us over all these years, it's this. If the person you're developing feels for refuses to so much as jump on a video call with you, watch out, something's just not right. As we're about to discover, things on the internet aren't always what they appear to be. But boy oh boy does it lead to some entertaining viewing. Kyla and Courtney. Okay, so here's a question for you. Do you believe in ghosts? Because if your answer is no, this catfish episode might just sway your opinion. You see, an 18 year old Kyla contacted the show as she'd been in contact with a lady named Courtney who had apparently established a connection with her father. Except Kyla's father had passed away 14 years prior. At the age of four, Kyla and her sister witnessed their father, who suffered from bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, brutally murder their mother. He was later incarcerated and two years after his imprisonment, sadly he took his own life. Things like the brand of cigarettes he smoked, how he liked his cheeseburgers with ketchup only, and she knew nobody on this earth should really know some of the certain things that she knows. She says she's a medium, and I mean, I really believe her. And although Kyla was convinced that the lady was real and she really was contacting her father from beyond the grave, her refusal to meet up raised some red flags. So when Neve and Max got to investigating, they were surprised to discover that Courtney's profile seemed legit. This didn't have the hallmarks of a typical catfish. In fact, based on all of her social media presence, it seemed like Courtney was exactly who she claimed to be. Their meeting was nothing short of spine tingling. Please. You have your dad's eyes. <laughs> the medium was able to reveal things that nobody else knew, leading to even Kyla's auntie, who was a total skeptic at the beginning, becoming convinced that Courtney really was speaking with the dead. In fact, it made Neve question what he thought he knew about the afterlife. I finished that episode genuinely believing that there is not only an afterlife, but that there is a way to communicate. So while the show's hosts and Kyla and her auntie are convinced that Courtney is the real deal, a number of fans of the show have their own theories. Many believe that Courtney and the deceased father may have written to each other while he was in prison, while others believe that she may have even been his mistress. What do you think? Leave a comment down below. Could it be that she really was communicating with the dead? Kid Cole and Lucille. The promise of glitz and glam can lure just about anybody. Throw in the name Kanye West to the mix and you have the perfect catfish scheme, if ever we saw one. This episode was different to the typical catfish romantic storyline. Instead of pretending to be a love interest, Kid Cole promised Lucille the opportunity to work for the Good Music label, a label linked to Kanye West. But there was a catch. In order to get the job, Lucille had to prove herself worthy. And by prove herself worthy, that meant she had to book shows and performances on behalf of Kid Cole entirely at her own expense. I've never been in a situation like this, so I didn't know what the red flags were. I thought that I was going to be leaving Philadelphia, getting this really awesome job at a major record label. And you probably already guessed it. Despite sorting everything out and paying for the bookings out of her own pocket, it was eventually revealed that Kid Cole was a complete fantasist with no ties to Kanye West, and Lucille had no chance of landing a job at the record label either. When Neve tracked down and confronted Kid Cole, real name Jerez Coleman, the complete lack of interest and sympathy he showed led to one of the most iconic moments from the show ever. Typically level-headed Neve got so triggered that he grabbed Jerez's phone from out of his hands and threw it into the river. I like that case. Can I see that? After being exposed on TV in such dramatic fashion, you'd think that Jerez would have learned his lesson, right? Wrong. I don't really like to do all this talking. Mm -hmm. I have a session tomorrow so you can actually see me. So to shut you up, I can like show you tomorrow. Great. It seems he developed a taste for tricking people. And in 2018, four years after the Catfish episode aired, he was again caught out after booking an event at the Philadelphia School for Performing Arts, posing as the official DJ for Alicia Keys under a new alter ego, DJ official silent assassin. When he showed up for the gig, 
DJ official Silent Assassin arrived with an entourage consisting of two women posing as photographers and two bodyguards as his security detail. This elaborate ruse sparked the curiosity of a student who dug deeper into who this DJ was and uncovered his creepy criminal past. It turns out that in May 2015, a year after the original Catfish show, Jerez Coleman was sentenced to 22 months in prison and was ordered to undergo mental health treatment after being found guilty of several terrorist criminal charges. The charges included making specific threats against the Washington Metro system, involving plans to take hostages on a Metro bus for a $15 million ransom, as well as plans to assassinate President Barack Obama. Wow! threatening to attack President Obama's motorcade. In another instance, he reportedly threatened to bomb a Metro bus if he wasn't paid $15 million. Danny and Rosa. These two met on Facebook in 2014 and grew to fall deeply in love with each other over time, or at least so it seemed. But Rosa kept on avoiding an in-person meeting, constantly coming up with different excuses, which was a clear red flag for the show's hosts, Neve and Max. And when they investigated the case, the duo discovered that a young man with exceptional bitterness and emotional scarring as a result of being bullied throughout high school was behind the catfishing. Posing as a lady called Rosa, he was in fact a 20 year old man named Jose. You see, in order to get back at his high school bully, a girl named Natalie, Jose started using her profile image in order to start talking to men online. And that's how he first ended up speaking with Danny. It was a hard pill for Danny to swallow, who can be seen asking Jose, Aren't you ashamed of yourself, bro? And what made the whole thing even more creepy was the scarily persuasive female voice that Jose had been using throughout, every single time they'd spoken on the phone. I used to do um, acting in high school, but that voice, like, I never tried it before. Can we hear the voice right now? I mean, I don't know what's going on. You know, a lot of things have been changing in my life. And although Danny could certainly be forgiven for feeling angry and storming off, the way this one played out makes us believe that a change of heart and forgiveness is possible when you show a little bit of empathy and compassion. You see, Jose was a very troubled young man with a history of drugs, jail and being sexually abused. And in what was the show's first religious scene, Danny ended up praying for Jose and granting him complete forgiveness. Bendícelo y dale una nueva vida de amor, de felicidad. Que Dios te bendiga, José. Muchas gracias. You're gonna be alright, man. Thank you. Okay? Yeah, You're gonna be alright. John and Kelsey. John contacted the show with suspicions that his online love, Kelsey, was not exactly who she claimed to be. And it turns out he was right to do so, because when Neve and Max tracked down the person behind the profile, they discovered it was a nonchalant Adam, self-proclaimed king of catfishers, who had a track record for tricking people and claimed he was actively catfishing 30 or 40 people. How many people do you think you've catfished? I would say about maybe 30, 40, around there. It's <sighs> just interesting to me and fun. Adam showed zero remorse for his actions, leading to a very obviously annoyed John to ask, So how'd you like my d pick? Yeah, that was, uh, it's interesting. Thank you for sending it to me. I, I really want that on my computer. <laughs> In what transpired to be one of the most sinister scenes ever on the show, Adam confessed that John's calm reaction to the whole thing wasn't what he was hoping for. The king catfish, it seems, was hoping to make John's blood boil is that the reaction you were hoping for? No, no, it's not actually. I was really hoping that you'd get really angry. I wanted to boil you, but it didn't seem to happen that way. It's too bad. What a strange, twisted guy. But if you thought that was bad, brace yourselves because this video is about to get even creepier. Mike and Caroline. Mike and Caroline met on the dating site Plenty of Fish and soon fell head over heels for each other. Caroline made it impossible for the two to see each other, despite living in the same city. Caroline, who is really a woman by the name of Heather, claimed that she had cancer and blamed the illness for her often flaky behavior. But here's where it gets kind of weird. Although they'd never met up in person, Caroline made it really difficult for Mike to throw in the towel because she'd often show up at his front porch and leave him handwritten love notes saying that she couldn't wait to see him later. She actually left a note on my Jeep. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Boo bit. 
She's even taken pictures of the outside of the work. And sent them and to you? Sent them to me. That's creepy. You have a stalker. And while there were certainly some obvious and massive red flags, it took quite some time for Mike to come around and contact Neve and Max. They shared many intimate details throughout their relationship, such as Caroline's cancer diagnosis, which hit Mike right where it hurts as his mother had recently passed away to cancer. When they did finally meet, Caroline, or should I say Heather, admitted to many of her lies, one being that the cancer she used to avoid meeting up in person was completely fictitious, although she hoped that he could forgive her. Made a big picture and it's not what I look like. Everything else I told you is me. Do you have cancer? No, I'm not sick. This story didn't end up in forgiveness, but Mike did get his happily ever after, because after the show aired, a fan of the show who saw him on TV got in touch when she thought he was cute, and a little while later, after they hit it off, the two actually got married. So I guess, in this case at least, every cloud has a silver lining. Whitney and Brie. In what was Catfish's first ever hoax, the hosts of the show found themselves the victim of a scheme fueled by two people in love. We figured it out, but we're here. We got catfished. There have to be easier ways to meet than to write into a television show. They're using us for a plane ticket. Did she really think we wouldn't figure it out? I just can't believe this. Whitney contacted the show as she'd been dating a person by the name of Bree for several years. The pair had met on an internet chat room and grown close, but they'd never had a single video call. Or so they claimed, because the story took a turn when Neve and Max discovered that Brie and Whitney were lying all along, and they were in fact in a legitimate long-term, long-distance relationship, including four years of Skype calls. When confronted, Whitney's initial reaction was to lie, but soon enough, with a little bit of encouragement, she ended up confessing that they contacted the show in order to have MTV pay for their plane tickets so that they could finally meet up in person. You'd lie to the show so that you could come on and then meet each other in person. Yeah. As students, money had always been an issue for them both, so they'd never had the funds to be able to meet up. So what they thought they'd do is use Catfish the show to pay for their plane tickets. Unsure of what to do at first, Neve and Max decided that the best thing was to unite these two lovebirds despite their dishonesty, and it seems that the pair are still happily together to this day. Hey, if you've made it this far to the end of the video, do me a favor, take a second just to press that like button to let me know that you're enjoying my content. It really does help the channel to grow. And let me know in the comments down below, which of these was the most shocking? Do you think there's any way that Courtney really was communicating with the dead? Let me know your thoughts down below. Thanks for watching, catch you on the next video.